Hi, I'm Tom Miggett from Tom Miggett Photography and today this is a new episode of Capture It With Tom Friends and my friend today is Nate Parker from Maine and more precisely the Mount Desert Island and you wonder where that is? Well, here is the Google map. So you see it's just on the east side of Portland in the US. Hi Nate. Good afternoon, Tom. How are you? Very well, thanks. Great. So. Guys, I've discovered Nate actually not a long time ago, a couple of uh, weeks ago, as I was uh, going on um, on Google Plus and all the communities and all the pages, and and one of my contacts happened to be a contact of Nate, uh, and uh, and I saw his picture <laughs> on uh, on his um, yeah on his mugshot, and it was him with his stripe on his shoulder, and suddenly it caught my interest. I'm like, oh, I've got to check if my friend knows him. Must be interesting. So I checked his. Mention website. your friend's name, Tom. Julian Cost. Hey, Julian, if you watch us. <laughs> uh, so, Great artist. Um, so I got intrigued. Checked uh, checked his website, and this is what you guys see here on the screen. Um, so for those who can't read, and you have the link in the description, it's called NateParkerPhotography.com. Uh, and you've got great uh, pictures there. I really uh, encourage you guys to go check it out. Uh, it's really inspiring. And today we're just gonna talk and learn about his approach to photography. Um, so Nate, how long have you been um, doing photography for? Uh, well, since year 2000, the start of the millennium. So you started with digital. Did you do film before at all or not? Well, I had a small, Instamatic film camera when I was a kid that I would shoot chipmunks and trees and bushes with. Uh, but uh, I went right to the digital in 2000. I got an Olympus C3000 3 megapixel camera for $800. <laughs> <laughs> and did you know already? Um, so I didn't mention, but Nate is, um, I think it's fair to say that Nate is a landscape photographer uh, mostly. Uh, and uh, did you know already when you started in 2000, did you know that landscape was what you wanted to do and it was in I did. Great and, uh, you know, and any other thing? I did. I did. Uh, and the big reason for that, the motivation was that uh, I had moved to this area shortly before then, uh, really about a year from uh, the Boston area. I came up here to uh, Maine and uh, Mount Desert Island, which is the home to Acadia National Park. And uh, it's an absolutely gorgeous place with rugged, sheer cliffs that come down to the ocean and beautiful pine trees. Uh, one of my first memories out here was uh, it was a stormy day in the fall. I'm out walking along on the shore and I look up and there's a giant bald eagle in the tree above me. And really, that was the first time in my life that I'd ever seen a bald eagle in person. And that thing was like 30 feet away. And so the whole thing was really captivating. And... Uh, yeah, I, I realized it. I just had this epiphany that uh, if I'm here on this coast, I really want to photograph it. I'd been actually considering photography for a while before then. There, I had had this idea where while I was living in Boston and going to college, I would have many different apartments. I would get this apartment, live there for a couple of years, get a new apartment, live there for six months, that kind of thing. And it occurred to me once that I'm going through all these doorways, the front door to the apartment or the, to the house, the building, and there are these really important portals. And I was thinking that uh, it would be a good photo. Or it's something that I wanted to re re remember. And uh, at the time, I didn't make images. I didn't make photography. So I wanted to get a camera just to take pictures of those doors. <laughs> that's, that's the first thing I ever wanted to do with a camera. And I think back in, in that time, digital photography was being talked about more and more, and it was becoming more accessible to people. And so uh, I think I've always been something of a techno geek, and so that was kind of percolating in my mind the whole time. So when I got up here, the the whole thing came together, and uh, shortly thereafter, I went and I got that camera. Mm. Uh, as you uh, as as you're talking and uh, on the on the screen here, people say. Uh, your slideshow um, going and so we can see a lot of your work on the on the main page of your of your website the, the, It is clear that the, we can see that you are capturing time 
uh, in your uh, in, in, in your work. Uh, we can see a lot of movement in your uh, uh, in your work. Uh, very rather long exposure for uh, uh, quite a majority of your work as well, uh, with the exception of this one here <laughs> showing. Uh, it's um, one thing that I find interesting is how you actually qualify your process. You actually call it yourself slow photography, uh, but I think having chatted with you earlier, it's not only your photography that is that we can qualify of slow. Uh, it's always also a way of living, right? I mean, you you talk about nature, it inspires you to to capture it and to to frame it uh, in your uh, in your camera, uh, but the whole way of living of that area uh, where you are is is slow as well, right? To some extent. Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, although you know, th there's something of uh, there's a there's a split there in a way where I'm really kind of an aggressive person. I drink a lot of coffee. I, I'm I really don't have a lot of patience. I tend to do things kind of rapidly, abruptly. Sometimes I knock things over because I'm in a rush. <laughs> that kind of comes from uh, I spent a lot of time uh, when I was growing up, uh, when I was younger, doing cooking and uh, professionally. And in that environment, it's a very fast-paced environment. So when I'm going to photograph, I am being extremely deliberate. And the photographs I'm making uh, are often... Uh, 30 seconds at least, if not a minute, many times two minutes, four minutes and things. So there's, uh, that's a, a real separate side of me where in my normal day-to-day -day life, I'm uh, not really slow, but in my photography, I am definitely slow. So, I mean, that, that, that's not just the exposure. That's, uh, the composition, uh, you know, not, not setting up the tripod or get my gear right out. I'm all ready to go. But uh, when I'm at a location, I'll spend uh, two, two and a half, three hours just in one place. And then I'll, I'll move to another place. So, And then I, I don't want to go with another person because I don't want to make them wait for me or have the feeling that they're waiting for me because I'll just stay and I'll, I'll just keep going and, uh, you know, slowly. And <clears throat> Maine is not the city. I grew up in the city, or in the area of the city in Boston, uh, and so uh, where we are here is, uh, there's a bunch of different areas of Maine, and interior Maine, there's a lot of farm country, and uh, uh, here, there's a, a few more people, but it's absolutely beautiful, it's gorgeous, and it is, uh, they call it vacation land, there's an expression like, uh, you're in Maine now, slow down, and all these things, so... That, that is a big component. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm a Gemini, so I, I do definitely have a split personality in that fashion. <laughs> and um, tell us about your gear, uh, because, I mean, we're going to go through your work. Uh, but before, before we go through some of your work, I want uh, people to understand uh, what you use so they can appreciate a, a, and realize whether they are lacking very very expensive cameras and lenses to achieve uh, the same level of quality or beauty of your of your own photograph. So, do you actually own a five thousand dollar camera? Uh, well, one way to put it is yes. <laughs> Another way to put it though is no. Uh, I have a five D Mark II, a Canon five D Mark II. So I got that. It's now what uh, three and a half years old to me, and uh, when I got it. I had the intention, pretty much, of keeping it forever, and I, I still do. I I want to have that camera forever, and I want to use it pretty much forever. Not to say that I won't uh, upgrade it to something else eventually, but uh, the five D Mark III is a much better camera. But I don't need it. There's really nothing in there. The autofocus system in that camera is much better than mine. I mean, that the five D Mark II autofocus system is primitive. At best, there's uh, nine autofocus points or seven and uh, one cross type point. So, <clears throat> but those are not really important things to me. I do a lot of manual focusing. I do a lot of live view, uh, zoom in focusing. So, uh, you know, I, I came from uh, my first Canon camera was the, uh, the uh, Rebel XT and... Uh, I really enjoyed 
the ability to control that camera coming from a point and shoot camera before then. Uh, I did not enjoy the kit lens that came with it, which was uh, 1855 to 56. Why? And uh, lens. it comes from free with a with a camera body. Uh, yes, which is fantastic. They have to give you something. <laughs> but uh, so you know what what Tom's talking about here is the idea that uh, I have an iPhone 5s here, and it's always in my pocket. Uh, my my big body is not always in my pocket. That's for sure. And uh, I use this camera all the time. And it makes a great photo. It makes a great print. I, I print these uh, 11 by 14 with very little interpolation or uh, any special considerations. But, uh, you know, it, your, your camera, your gear is your instrument. And you want to be able to forget about it. You want to just be able to focus on your composition, on your, uh, your, your feelings and your, your process. And not be limited, certainly, by anything. But I have found that uh, certain things of the gear that I used to use, uh, I would never want to go back to. And if I did, the images that I make now, I would have to have a different approach to making them. Uh, good quality glass is just something that you should be able to experience. If you haven't experienced it before, then... Uh, it's uh, a real joy. It's, it's a great thing to be able to get the fidelity out of a scene, to have the feeling of being immersed in the image when you look at it, instead of looking at it like, oh, that's a picture. So uh, these days, uh, my favorite lens is uh, the uh, 24 millimeter f3.5 tilt shift. It, which is, oh, uh, this is tilt shift. I mentioned it. Um... Uh, in, in, in a video exact, almost a year ago when I talked about perspective and it's important to, uh, to, to find your own perspective when you, when you go out there shooting, especially when you go to those touristic places where you've got buses of a uh, hundred Japanese and Chinese just arriving and they're all snapping at the same, the, the, the same monument or, uh, a, a, and you know, everybody's going to end up with the same picture at the end. And it's, it's important to find perspective. And I've mentioned the tilt shift lens. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Because I, I, I didn't talk about it. I don't own one. Uh, can you tell us why you used it? What, uh, how it works? Yeah, well, it's a fantastic lens. This lens, uh, I wanted for a long time before I ever got one. And I purchased it used from b and Photo. Uh, I got it for a great deal. Pretty much half the price that the new ones go for. And uh, the reason I wanted it is because I wanted... Uh, Whereas uh, my approach is landscapes for the most part, I wanted to, first of all, try to uh, have more depth of field, uh, sharper image, uh, control of uh, the scene. Uh, I, I had an understanding that the lens would be able to afford me that. So I would never tried one out before I got it. Like I said, I wanted one for a couple of years. I kind of fantasized about the thing. When I got it, though, it was uh, a really eye-opening experience in the way where it felt like all of a sudden that I was making photography all over, brand new, like I was starting brand new, in a way where uh, the the controls of the lens are, they're fairly complicated. It, it only moves in three ways. It does uh, the tilt, which is this way. It does the shift, which is this way. And then it does a rotate which is this way. Look, look how crazy it can look. Uh, with all that, I mean, that is just weird. But, uh, so, when I first started using the lens, uh, there, the, the controls that it, it affords you, that you can make so many drastic changes to your scene. You look at a bush right in front of you. A simple, basic, nothing going on scene here. And you can change the look of that dramatically by uh, adding rise here, uh, taking focus out in the corners here, rotating it over there. But not just that, uh, after the fact, in post, looking at the images were the sharpest images that have ever come out of my camera. And uh, that was uh, just a, a fabulous thing. So <clears throat> the way I tend to use the lens often is... Uh, uh, 
Thomas alluded to earlier, I make a majority of my work is long exposures, seascapes, and uh, so I'll go to the ocean and say, for instance, there's an image that has uh, breakwater going out into the ocean at an oblique angle. Uh, what I can do is I can uh, add tilt, so I can uh, put just a thin little sliver plane of focus, say down the middle of the scene, uh, rotate that tilt, so just the plane of focus is going along the breakwater, and then everything above and below the breakwater is blurred. That's that's one thing I can do. I can do the uh, well. Sorry, we we actually looking at the dock on the bay, uh, which is oh, yeah. the one that you you used um, the the feature of that lens to uh, to achieve the result. And uh, right. you can see on your screen the, uh, the, the 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 left the top left corner. Uh, so that's the opposite, though. Yeah. Where uh, if you know, so, I was rotating that instead of to have the focus go along the dock. I wanted the corners to be blurred just, just for the aesthetic effect of that. So instead of having it rotated along that 45 degree angle there, I had it kind of rotated. Uh, a thing that I use the lens for very much is when you shift the lens up, say up and down like this, or if you rotate it and then side by side, I'll have my camera locked off in a tripod, and I can uh, rise the lens up, come down to zero, and lower the lens down, and those three images stitched together, and after the fact, have uh, a wider scene than just the 24 millimeters will give me, more like 15 millimeters of a scene, and then also... And then also the, uh, the file, instead of it being like 20 megapixels or so, will be pretty much 60. So I make a lot of prints, and that affords a kind of, uh, there's more resolution. And uh, so I'm often stitching vertically, horizontally. And they work out to be 4 by 5 uh, ratio. So uh, we were talking earlier about that too, where... I hardly ever go with a 2 by 3 crop factor anymore because I think it's kind of skinny and I just find uh, the 4 by 5 more appealing and elegant. So all those things. But not to say that I'll always use that lens if it's rainy out or if it's hideous, snowing, sleeting or something. There's no weather ceiling so water will be pouring in so then I'll go to uh, my uh, 17 to 40 or so. Using that lens for uh, for quite some time now, you have you developed a an awareness for its capability that when you walk on your island uh, and well, which you know by heart now, I would expect uh, you already foresee what trickery you're going to be using, or you actually take first a normal shot and then you start a kind of a try and miss. Uh, type of process and see okay how would that look if actually th that corner would be blurred or that corner would be blurred or at the bottom would be blurred suddenly kind of miniature type of looking uh, do you how do you what, what's your approach on this yeah uh and that's part of the reason why i spend so much time at a place is because i'll run through all those things often uh like you said i'll, I'll make the first shot pretty much straight uh, with no t tweaks, or unless that I really have a feeling that I want to do something that, that I, I want to have that like you know 45 degree angle with the focus just in the middle kind of thing, or something like that, or or just go with uh, the uh, the stitch bit. But uh, the lens is uh, there is a, a lot of uh, surprises that it'll give to you. So I, I will run through. I mean, it's been uh, what two and a half years since I've had it now, or so or uh, about, about two years, just over two years. And it still uh, surprises me all the time with... Uh... So that, that's the thing, I mean, photography is, for me, it, it's a, a passion and it's a hobby and it's not my living. So I do photography for enjoyment. Uh, I mean, I do photography to make prints too and to try to sell them and that, that kind of thing, but it's not my driving force. So uh, when you do a thing for a while, you get used to it, you develop an approach, and so when you go to make a picture, you use your approach to go do it. So then that's kind of uh, by rote 
And I think that takes some of the fun out of it. So uh, the, uh, that lens really gives uh, the feeling of newness again, of like you, you kind of don't know what you're gonna get sometimes, which is, uh, that's, that's, that's fun. You, you said at the beginning of this interview that um, the, the reason why you got into photography was because you had the chance to live where you live. Uh, and that was very inspiring. And you said, uh, well, I have to, f I have to freeze that moment. I have to freeze what I see. I have to have tangible proof that I've seen it. I was there. I witnessed it. Um, but then when we look at your work, um, people might wonder, uh, well, yes, but how come then you, you edit it? You know, there are people who believe that, you know, you should, they don't believe in Photoshop. They will spit and swear at Photoshop. Uh, and they believe that, you know, especially when you do landscape, you f capture the reality of it and that's it. Uh, and currently on the screen, we see transit. So that trunk, uh, the tree trunk that you see on the floor. Uh, and it's fantastic. I love the color, I love the tone, as I told you before. Uh, but clearly that's been edited and, and, and like most of the work. Uh, and I really appreciate why you actually uh, do the edit. So how, what would you say to those people? They don't dare going into Photoshop or Lightroom. They don't know what to, what approach they should, uh, they should take. What do you have to say about this? Right. Well, it's, uh, I think developing images, uh, is the, the most impar important part of my workflow. Capturing for me is, uh, uh, a scientific document. I want to get all the information that I can so that later on I can work with everything I have, uh, that I'm not missing anything. But uh, when I'm, after the fact, when I'm doing the developing, that's where the image comes out. Uh, so the, the stylizing and things, uh, that's the important part of the process for me. That the capture itself, you wanna make sure it's sharp, you wanna make sure that all your technique is spot on, but after the fact, that's where I think the artistry comes in. So <clears throat> when you start photography, you hit the button, the camera gives you something, you come home, you like it or you don't like it. Then you start to think, oh, well, how do I do it so that I like it all the time? And then eventually down the road, you start making critical decisions after the fact in post-processing as to how to control the image. That's what I taught myself uh, through tutorials and things as to, uh, I use Lightroom and I use uh, Photoshop CS5, an old one. And I'll, I'll use uh, a bunch of Nick products and uh, I'll spend uh, a couple hours making captures and then I'll spend a few hours at least on e each image making the developments. Uh, so I used to d do more straight, not as uh, obviously worked on images, but these days... Uh, I like uh, a fair amount of contrast. I like a fair amount of darkness. Uh, I'll do uh, kind of a lot of dodging and burning and things. And uh, I, I'm making all those decisions. It's I, on the spot, on the site, I might not really know all the time where I'm gonna take the image. I might just know that the scene has a lot to offer, that there's something about it that I, I should be making the image. Other times I'll be making the image and uh, say it's a summer morning warm sunset and there's beautiful colors in the sky i'll know i want to go with the color image and uh i'll know i want to take out uh say those lobster buoys in the water and, and things like this uh i don't do any compositing or uh any complicated tricks like that but uh i do spend a lot of time uh recovering highlights uh putting vignettes, adding brightness here, and burning down there, and uh, selective sharpening and things. But uh, everybody should learn. If you have a passion for photography, you should learn not just the camera, but uh, how to develop your images. Yeah. I think that's a really important thing. Yeah. We look at, Right now we're looking at a, uh, uh, one of your work called uh, Flotsam. And uh, since we're talking about... Um, seeing things you know you walk on your island and you you capture what you see uh and you we just talked about the whole processing of colors in uh, in lightroom photoshop and all the plugins that go for photoshop 
given that this month uh, the, the the monthly contest the theme is black and white um, how do you actually approach um, black and white photography do you already know when you're going to take the shot that you already foresee that this is going to be a black and white or you take it color and as often with many with many people they take the color one and they know they're not crazy by the results and they try a few things in Lightroom and Photoshop and it turns out not as good for many reasons. And somebody says, well, what if actually desaturated stuff and let's go with black and white and increase the contrast and get the texture out that sometimes the color doesn't give us. Uh, so what, what's your approach with black and white? Right, well, uh, pretty much 90% of the time I will know when I'm making an image if I'm going to go black and white or color. Uh, for the most part, I usually do black and white photography. Uh, summer times, beautiful summer mornings, I'll want to retain that color. So those images, I'll, I'll do color. And I'll know it at the time when I'm doing it. So for the black and white decision-making process itself, after the fact that I know it's going to be black and white, things I consider are uh, amounts of contrast and amounts of micro-contrast and... Uh, and pretty much like how bright or how dark I want the image to look. So uh, after making and looking at pictures for a long time, I have a really strong feeling as to what the right amount of contrast is, which is to say like how much black or c compared to, uh, well, contrast. And if there's too much contrast and it feels too heavy, it, 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 just right away, you you have the feeling that it's, and as far as micro contrast, when there's too much structure and things uh, seem to have kind of like sharpening effects or artifacts, then that that's where you draw the line. So I think that, uh, and also <clears throat> I used to be more uh, always going to the right side of the slider scale with contrast, but these days I might uh, have a lot more consideration to go to the left side to take the contrast down in combination with uh, micro-contrast and uh, structure and uh, details and, and clarity and things. You, so... Sorry, I just have one question. Do you um, do you actually set your camera to get a, cop a JPEG copy, uh, black and white, of your image while you're on the spot, while you're on location, or you actually shoot and only see the, the LCD proof being color and you, 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 base, you, you base your judgment on, on the color version? Yeah, sometimes I'll use a black and white mode, uh, but probably less than half the time. Uh, <clears throat> I capture only in RAW. I don't use RAW plus JPEG, but of course the LCD readout is a JPEG. But uh, sometimes I will use that mode, uh, a black, and, a dedicated black and white mode, with, say, a red filter or a blue filter, and with a uh, white balance shift to help with the visualization after the fact, it might lead to another idea that I might not have considered at the time. And uh, so I have, I do have a, a mode on my camera set for a uh, dedicated black and white manual mode and a dedicated black and white bulb mode. But uh, I usually capture and just look at it in color. And I mean, because I've been doing it for uh, quite a while now, developing in black and white, the, the color doesn't throw me off at all. We capture in color. You, you want to capture all the values you can so that in post-processing you can tweak all, have all the information you can. So first of all, that's why we shoot in RAW, but that's also why we develop black and white files out of color files. So how does that, how does a, a Nate Parker portrait looks like? Well, I like portraiture. I like doing portraits. I have a uh, 100 millimeter 2.8 IS lens that I purchased just for portraits. Uh, I also have a uh, Nifty 50, and I replaced that this summer with a 40 millimeter 2.8 pancake that I think is a great lens as well. And uh, <clears throat> I like to do environmental portraits. I don't really do lights, uh, butterfly lighting, soft boxes, strip boxes, or anything like that. Although I would like to get some someday. But uh, I think that the face is uh, immensely interesting, especially if you have an interesting face. I, I don't think the most interesting faces are usually beautiful. Yes. Yeah.
do you do uh, it's funny because you, you're talking about um, the most interesting faces and for some reason in my head I was thinking of dragon effect for example because you usually tend to apply it to people who or you try to replicate interesting faces people with like wrinkles and everything um, do you do HDR by any chance because I, I know there's a lot of folks uh, in the audience that do uh, HDR probably maybe even more than they should <laughs> so, uh, <yeah. laughs> sorry guys <laughs> I've done I have uh, for about two to three years I only did HDR okay uh, that was back in uh, the uh, rebel days and uh, I think that part of that was uh, trying to, uh, what's the word, uh, trying to overcome some of the limitations of the camera. And back then I didn't know about filtration, like uh, graduated neutral density filters and things, or have the program Lightroom. And I definitely went way down the rabbit hole there uh, to uh, a troubling uh, uh, extent where a lot of the images from that period are, are ruined. I don't have the original raw files, or I just have the uh, the final edits, and I think they're loud, unnatural, and uh, have aberrations and things. So these days, I'll still do an HDR occasionally, and it won't be necessarily of a sunset, but it might be more of uh, in the woods or something, uh, uh, maybe a lower contrast scene. And I, I used to use photomatics for that. But now I had gotten the uh, Nick package this summer and the uh, HDR FX version 4. I have been uh, checking out a little bit. And I think the thing is with that, that uh, in my work, now that I don't do the HDR anymore, it doesn't have that look. And if I do an HDR that's uh, going with a really natural kind of approach where I'm trying to keep it from looking that way, just trying to use it to uh, recover or bring up uh, things that uh, that it still really has the feeling of it being a little different. And if I'm looking at a picture and all of a sudden I start thinking about what went into the picture to make it it instead of just being a picture, then I'm not looking at the picture anymore. So I, I think if there's any element of a photo that, that's distracting, uh, you ought not to have it in there. Yeah, I think uh, nuances are really important and subtleties. Replay value for a photograph or for a print. So if you could put a print on your wall and look at it two or three years later and still find it interesting and appealing and beautiful, then that's a really great image. But if you have an image that is, uh, you know, uh, there's pyrotechnics and so much color and so much going on. I think it can be exhausting, just just mentally exhausting to look at. And something like that won't have the replay value. So I think subtleties are more important than uh, hit you over the head dramaticisms. <laughs> well, on that uh, on that bombshell, we'll go, we're going to end our interview. It was a real genuine pleasure to. Uh, to meet you and to uh, to talk to you we've been uh, chatting for uh, well, half an hour with you guys uh, and it was uh, very inspiring uh, i love your work like i said i really guys encourage you to go and check the nateparkerphotography.com and also hey little one wow that's a little <laughs> and also follow uh, nate on uh, on all the social media uh, i know he's out there on uh, on facebook and we'll see the uh, the, the link in the description this is also on uh, on Google Plus as well uh, very active there so if you want to follow him and follow all the all the beautiful things he does and crazy things as well in terms of videos sometime uh, but very uh, very inspiring uh, very interesting individual so thank you so much Nate uh, for your cool Tom thank you very much it's been a pleasure. good times Cheers. nice to meet you my friend from Scotland I'll be there someday I hope so so this is it. Uh, this is Tom Miguel saying, if you like it, well, capture it. Ciao.